Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, the conference today. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Tomoki Arifti, Arifti um, who is uh, actually an MSc clinical uh, scientist and a clinical senior lecturer in perinatal imaging in King's College London. So he's doing all his research in the Center for the Development Brain, and he also had a, a visiting position in the Human Robotics uh, Group in the Imperial College. Uh, so he obtained his PhD in, in Imperial College um, in 2012. Well, yeah. uh, and uh, actually, he worked mainly on the uh, functional MRI techniques uh, applied in, in baby <laughs> and uh, with a special focus on uh, sensory motor development. But since then, he has uh, done several things, uh, among which combining EEG and fMRI. And he's also really interested in the early identification and care of newborns with perinatal brain imaging. So he both aim to develop new techniques and apply them to, to the babies. And uh, uh, today he will talk uh, mainly about uh, what they've been doing since a few months in uh, seven Tesla in, in babies. So we are super excited, excited by hearing uh, what you will tell us. And we thank you again for accepting this invitation. Thank you, Tom. Do I, I can speak without this one, can I? I'm very loud. Hopefully you can all hear me. So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Jessica, for the lovely introduction. And thank you for everyone for coming on a Monday morning. Um, uh, je parle un petit peu le, le français, uh, so everything's going to be in anglais, I'm afraid. So if I speak too fast or, or it's not clear, then please just ask for, for clarification. I, I don't mind uh, repeating it or, or trying to slow down if I'm a bit fast. Um, but it's a tremendous <clears throat> honor to be here. Thank you, Jessica, for the invitation. And um, Obviously, for me, it's it's very exciting to talk about the ultra high field imaging work that we've been doing in London. But obviously, you guys here are the world leaders in, in ultra high field imaging and have been for some time. So it's it's really exciting to talk to you guys here today and also to get your input as well and and to get some of your ideas about different directions that we could start to go in as well. Because at the I would say what we've done in London is really just scratching the surface of what's possible with ultra high field imaging um, with neonates with, with young babies. And so um, I'm really excited about what the future will bring. So today really is just to talk about the preparation work that we've done and some of the, I suppose, the, what I think are exciting first results. Uh, and then really what we're thinking about now is what are the big questions, what are the big neuroscience questions, what are the big challenges, what are the new co contrasts, what are the new questions that we can try and answer and think about with ultra high field imaging. So <clears throat> I'm conscious about the fact that the audience is not entirely people who work in, in developing brain research. So I have put some uh, um, a few slides just about why it's worth studying the developing human brain at all. Hopefully you'll all be converts by the end of three slides. Um, I think there's no more important time in life to, uh, to investigate. It's a really important time, not just for setting the scene for what happens in your brain across the lifespan, but of course, if you have injuries at the, at the start of your life, either during the pregnancy or, or around the time of birth, it can have really profound implications for what it means for you, for a child moving across and, and across their lifespan. And, and that's why I think it's a really important place, to, to time to study. Um, then, of course, I'm preaching in English. You say you're preaching to the converted or preaching to the choir, but <clears throat> then I was going to talk very briefly about why it's worth imaging at ultra high field. And then, of course, the key questions are, is it safe? Is it feasible? And then um, explore what can we gain in, from our first results of, of imaging the developing brain at ultra high field. So why study the developing brain at all? So um, these are uh, basically, this is a surface atlas that's been generated from the Developing Human Connectome Project, which is a large study that we did in London, which um, Andrea has used it for her PhD. And I think many people we're proud to say are using it around the world. Uh, this is from fetal scans. And the reason I put it just here as a starting point is to basically say, well, <clears throat> it's amazing to see how much the human brain is. Um, let's get rid of this bit of this is in the way, isn't it? Um, it's amazing to see how much the human brain is changing, how rapidly it's changing over a course of weeks. If you look at the difference between the brain at 21 weeks and the brain at 26 weeks, so five weeks, you can already see how much difference there is in terms of the folding on the brain. And then if you compare them to 31 weeks and 36 weeks, it's just remarkable to think that over the course of a matter of few weeks that the brain is changing this much in terms of its cortical configuration. But of course, it must be changing in terms of the tissue composition and in terms of the kind of connections that are developing inside the brain. 
And so it's a really very rapid and dramatic maturational time for the brain. And what's important to say is that this sequence of maturation is very programmed, actually, what we find inside the brain. So if you look at brains across different what we call post-menstrual ages, so uh, since the, uh, the last menstrual period for a mother, we can see that it's very consistent, actually, across babies. And that means that it's a very programmed sequence, despite the fact it's very rapid. And so it's a very, very fundamental period for establishing the brain's lifelong framework of all the connections, which we obviously will study across the lifespan later on. And we know that disruptions at this very early stage have got very marked effects on neurological function. And so I always think a key period, and, <clears throat> and I think this is why Jessica and I have spent so much time researching it, is to think about the preterm period as a really good example of, of um, why it's worth studying this period and thinking about the key implications of this period. So this is, I have to confess, just a picture I've stolen off Google, but it really is just to show you to get you thinking, to set your scene about, to think what's happening to this brain, okay? So this is a tiny preterm baby. They probably will weigh, if you've not seen a preterm baby, they weigh about 500 grams, okay? So if you imagine the size of a bottle of Coke, it's the same size as a bottle of Coca-Cola. The size of the head is about the size of a tennis ball. And this baby, you can see, you can see the person's hand next to it, but you can also see this baby has got all kinds of different things attached to it, okay? So it's got a tube going into its throat to help it to breathe. It's got different kinds of uh, lines going into its arm that you can see. And you can see it's not constrained to being inside a womb. It's not surrounded in fluid. It's not inside a protective area like it would be inside the womb. So people can touch it. All these different kinds of stimulation can happen to it. And all of these things are going to have a profound different effect on that massive, massive, important process of brain development, which I showed you on the last slide. So what does this mean? What we know is that preterm birth then has a massive impact both on the way these children develop, but also on society. Because we know that two thirds of children born very preterm, so that's less than 28 weeks, we know two thirds of them will have some form of disability. We know cerebral palsy is common. So around 10% of these children will have cerebral palsy. Uh, but we actually know that cognitive and behavioral difficulties in the kids are even more common. And if we just think about the USA alone, the societal cost of preterm birth in the USA was in 2019 was estimated at $25.2 billion. So it's, it has enormous societal implications. And <clears throat> understanding what causes these difficulties in the developing brain, really, uh, if we think back to even when I started, when I was at medical school in the 90s, what we were looking at was really some pioneering studies that were done in Harvard by people like Hannah Kinney and, and so on. They were looking at histological samples and they identified particular kind of changes, particularly in the white matter of preterm babies. Um, so things like what you can see on the center here. So this is periventricular leukem lacy, and you can see some cysts across the white matter here. This is a uh, general matrix hemorrhage. So this is a, or an intraventricular hemorrhage that you can see here with dilatation of one of the ventricles. And so much of what we knew about what was causing difficulties for these babies was based on post-mortem and animal studies. And of course, that meant that very little was known about the natural history of disease. And of course, very little was known about really what was, what was normal. And so how can imaging help us to understand this? So imaging, of course, has completely transformed this. So it's become a key tool in, in clinical practice. Um, so just here you can see, for example, this is a child with hypoxic brain injury, and we can see on the diffusion, you can see the area of restricted diffusion within the, the basal ganglia. Um, but also, of course, and, and again, I'm preaching to the choir here, but advanced MR methods have really started to pro provide really new insights into neuroscience and understanding the brain. And in development, it's allowing us to understand their normal brain development, uh, including changes in, in microstructure, connectivity, and of course, how alterations can lead to adverse outcomes. But all of these studies that we've done over the years and, you know, I, I've done over the last 15 years, one thing to say is that often what we're looking at is population level correlation. OK, so we look at relationships between population level outcomes and let's say gestational age or some kind of clinical factor. And actually, as a clinician, because I also am a clinician who looks after children who have unfortunately got cerebral palsy or the sequelae of, of what happens to their brain when they're young, um, what families want to know is that they want to know exactly what it means for their single child. And of course, if we're going to do that and we're going to be able to try and treat it, then we have to think about having some kind of mechanistic understanding about why these children go on to have different difficulties. So what precisely is the mechanism that then follows on from an injury and how it changes their, their brain development or their connectivity or how the brain works? And that, of course, is, is then why we could start thinking about ultra high field. So um, these are just images um, showing really the kind of gains that you can get comparing 7T to 3T. 
um, for, for instance, in epilepsy, looking at the differences that you might see in the hippocampus. So on the 70 image here, you can see much more clearly the, the kind of configuration of the hippocampus. And here, this is an example of, of epilepsy, looking at the differences that you can see inside the cortex and seeing that there's some thickening and some abnormal area of cortex at the back here. So ultra high field really markedly increases SNR, but it also allows us then as a result to acquire much higher resolution images and increase the contrast for particularly um, for particular kinds of images and for particular kind of contrast mechanisms, which particularly are dependent on magnetic susceptibility. And so, as I was saying, this increased sensitivity has already proved valuable in clinical studies of so things like epilepsy and, and multiple sclerosis. So how about imaging neonates at ultra high field? So only one center in the world up until um, when we started had, had done this very previously, and there have been feasibility studies in, in Utrecht, um, who we had a very good um, uh, chat with. We, we know the researchers in, in Utrecht very well, and we had a long chat with them. They have a Philips system. And so we discussed with them about the workup that they did, and, and we worked with them to help uh, develop their safety protocols as well. So these are some of their first images that you can see here. The three T images are across the top, the seven T images across the bottom here. And so their first paper that was published in AGNR in 2020 was really about the feasibility. I think they described the first 15 or something like that infants that they scanned. Um, I think when you look on here, you probably would say that the images are at least as good as the 3T ones, but I wouldn't necessarily say that in their first images, and they say this themselves, that they had really got to a point where they felt really good about their seven Tesla imaging. Uh, I think you can probably start to get a hint that you can see more on their susceptibility weighted imaging here. You can see there's more contrast in the T2 weighted image. Um, but you can see that the T1 image is, is probably not really as good as the T1 image. You can see the MRS is, is quite nice. You can see there's a lot less noise in the baseline. But I think at this stage, what they really wanted to know is, um, is can we start to image at 70 safely? Uh, and then at the moment, you know, talking with them, what they're really still thinking about, and which is, of course, what we're also thinking about, is what are the big kind of questions that we now want to, to use this technology for? The other piece of important work that they've done, which is published this year, was to start thinking about the clinical safety of imaging neonates at ultra high field. Uh, and so they've done a nice comparison between 3T and 7T. And you can see here just in the heart rate of the babies going into the scanner and then the uh, oxygen saturations and then their temperature. You can see that it's very comparable for their babies who are a mean age of 44 plus six weeks postmenstrual age and 4.2 kilograms. So all of those things were stable, both um, were comparable between seven Tesla scanning and three Tesla scanning. It was nice. They also used a, a comfort score, which looked at whether or not the babies were getting upset or crying or, or any kind of uh, behavioral parameters were changing when they were imaged on the 7T system. And again, you can see it's very comparable between 7T and 3T. So for us, it's a, it was a nice starting point. It was um, also important for our ethics committee to know that um, they could see that other institutions had done some 7 Tesla work and they felt comfortable that we were doing something that would be... Um, at least uh, had been done previously. So the first challenge then from our perspective was to really think about safety. So we had our seven Tesla scanner installed in 2019. Uh, and then we started to scan the first human subjects. Um, actually, I have a funny story about this. So in 2020, and unfortunately, the world went into lockdown. Myself and, and another colleague who I share my office with, um, Jonathan Omoretic, we were the two of the very first people to be scanned on the seven Tesla scanner. And then after the world went into lockdown, then you weren't allowed to consent new patients to be scanned. So me and Johnny had about 50 or something like this, seven Tesla scans over the course of the first year and a half of the scanner because there were no other patients who, or no other subjects who were allowed to be recruited. So our, our seven Tesla scanner, unfortunately, was installed at a very bad time in terms of being able to get going with imaging programs in general. But it did mean for us that we could really do the work that we needed to do in terms of assessing safety, establishing institutional protocols and getting our ethics clearance to be able to scan. So the first thing to say, of course, is that the current generation of seven Tesla MRI scanners are FDA and CE approved, but not for infants. We have a, a Siemens Magnuson Terra system, which I think is what you have here as well. The minimum mass, oh gosh, uh, the minimum mass that um, theoretically a patient can go into the scanner is actually 30 kilograms. And of course, we'll be using off-label use of, we use a, a single transmit 32 channel receive head coil, a Nova head coil. And um, we presumed at the start of this that the SAR model then that would go with this head coil and, and obviously in the seven Tesla system would not be suitable for a neonate. 
The other equipment that we use as standard when we're scanning infants on the 3T, so physiological monitoring of their heart rate, the oxygen saturations, the temperature and so on, of course, is also not approved for use at ultra high fuel. So these were really the first challenges. Of course, they're boring challenges, but they're important challenges to, to move past before we can start scanning infants. So I'm afraid the next 10 slides are all about these kind of safety things before we actually sh I'll show you any images. Um, but I thought it might be interesting and useful for you because these, I suppose, presumably would be things or, or considerations that you might have on this site as well if you were to start consider scanning infants. So the first thing that we thought about was noise. Um, interestingly, actually, we discovered the acoustic noise levels on our Siemens um, Terra system were actually lower than on our Philips Achiever system, which is a much older system. And so I think the gradients are just not as well shielded acoustically. So our initial sh assessment showed the highest acoustic noise was up to about 98 decibels on the Siemens system. Um, the Terra was, as I said, below the Philips Achiever. And then using the existing sound um, acoustic protection that we use on babies, so ear putty that we use inside the, the baby's ear canal, and then um, padding and, and inflatable pads over the years, reduces the sound levels by about 30 decibels, which takes it obviously well down to about 60 decibels, which is below, in the UK anyway, the, the MHRI guidelines of 85 decibels. So then we then moved on to focus on SAR and the related thermal risk from the off-label use of the head coil. Um, and so we made a, a generic RF coil model um, because we didn't have the manufacturer coil model from, from, um, the, the, from Nova. Um, and then we constructed a model similar to published literature. And we had two neonatal models that were constructed with adapted um, dielectric properties specifically for a neonate. And then we used Sim for Life to then perform um, the electromagnetic and thermal simulations. This is all work done by uh, my wonderful Felix colleague, F Phillips, physics colleague, that was a Freudian slip, physics colleague, um, Shahan Malik, who you can see in the corner here. So Shahan has been, um, I suppose, my partner in crime for the last three years. And this has really been a labor of love for the two of us working really hard on, on trying to get to the point where we have now. Um, so the previous study done by Shahan at 3T um, was, was where we started from, which interestingly found that SAR and Anina were much less than an adult. And so it meant that there was much more security about scanning than 3T on a neonate than there was on an adult. But conversely, at 7T, what we found is that actually SAR, particularly around the head, is probably likely to be higher in neonates. Mm -hmm. And that meant <clears throat> tuning down the head coil down to 127 megahertz. It meant thinking a bit more carefully about what we're going to do with the kind of sequence that we're going to use and what kind of um, safety things that we're going to put in place to make sure that there's absolutely no risk uh, when we're scanning babies. So one important thing is that thermal simulations usually assume that your subject is naked. OK, and what we realized is that we have to think differently about babies, because with babies, the usual risk actually is of them getting cold. And that's because they've got differences in body composition and obviously intrinsically with their thermoregulation. So all babies, when we scan them in our center, and I'm sure the same is done here, what we're worried about is them getting cold rather than hot. And what we do is we swaddle them up in blankets. We make sure the room's not as cold as it usually is for an adult. We often turn off the fan and we monitor their temperature throughout the scan. And so this was something that we we're conscious of, that we needed to actually change our model and say, right, this baby should really be wrapped up in a blanket rather than consider them being naked. Uh, and then we also adjusted then our heat transfer coefficient to match this data on, on what would happen if they were being passively cooled. So these, this was the result of our stimulation, uh, simulations. And basically what we said is let's expose our model then to um, power, which would lead to maximum SAR, so eight watts total. Um, and the simulations actually suggested, which you can see across the bottom here, if they're insulated, that actually there would be some warming around the back of the neck, would be the maximum area. And we may see some rises in systemic core temperature under the conditions of prolonged scanning on maximum SAR. OK, so what you can see here is that if you've got a um, the core temperature here and you've got an insulated baby, it's the red trace that you can see across here and uninsulated, we still have a baby that's getting cold, actually. And so what we um, basically said was, OK, well, this what this tells us is that we don't want to wrap our babies up really, really tightly, but we don't want them to get cold. But also what we can say is that even scanning with maximum saw that we probably have a period of a good kind of five, uh, five minutes or so where we know that we haven't got too much of a temperature rise. And even if we do 10 minutes, we still got fairly minimal temperature rise and certainly not above the kind of limits that we're concerned about. So after we did these simulations, then we established conservative limits and we said, OK, we need to have these conservative limits because SAR is likely higher. So we set 
our K factors so that all the sign limits are respected. And it basically makes it forces the user to select first level mode and the K factor set at 2.8. And that means that we'll kind of reach these um, uh, average local and head average limits much quicker. And so all neonatal scans in our institution are also performed under medical supervision. So we're constantly monitoring the patients and just checking that there's no physiological stress during the scans. Um, we have a, this is very boring, so I'll probably fly past it, but it's basically to say what we do then is then we have a coil switch where we change the coil file on the Siemens scanner to enforce this change in K factor. It's countersigned by two experienced operators every time. The patient actually is entered with the incorrect weight because you can't enter the, we had two options, either you enter the baby in as a phantom or you enter the baby in as a 30 kilogram person. And so we we opted to go for the 30 kilogram person rather than to say they're a phantom. Um uh, a part of this was because we're connected to the hospital system, and so you can't transfer also a phantom data set to the hospital system. So it, it obviously makes the whole thing a little bit more um, uh, more challenging if you to do it that way. Anyway, regardless, um, what we did is, is we put them in as 30 kilograms and we verify that doesn't affect our local SAR estimation because of the change in K factor. Um, and um, just to mitigate the, the thermal risk, then we obviously keep continuously monitoring the core temperature during the scan. The safety equipment uh, basically is monitor equipment that's not certified, of course, for use on the seven Tesla scanner, but it is um, developed specifically for their MR environment. So we use a Philips in vivo system. Uh, we use some, uh, um, we use the thermal imaging camera to check whether or not there's any heating of the system itself. We uh, stuck all the monitoring bits on ourselves, including attaching the leads on our face and things like that, because we know that a baby's, if they've got cardiac leads on, for example, they're gonna be much closer to inside the, the, the ball than if it's a, an adult subject. And also, of course, they'll be much uh, closer to the transmit field because the baby's head is right inside the coil and their chest is, is right next to the coil as well. So we, we basically checked whether or not there was any heating at all on ourselves. And then we checked whether or not there was any noise on, on the images and so on as well. So. At the end of all of that, we felt very confident and we wrote up our, our institutional um, process. It was approved through several layers of institutional approvals uh, to the point, And that took us two and a half years before we reached that point where we cleared all of those things. And also ourselves, that we felt very confident that we were doing something that was safe. Um, I didn't mention, for example, we went and bought a, a piece of pork in the local butchers, uh, which was we asked them specifically for a th three kilogram piece of pork that we could estimate would be the same size as a baby. We let it warm up to room temperature and then we uh, we scanned it. So we, we went through a whole process of trying to make sure that we really felt we were doing something that was going to be safe. And then finally, in May 2022, we reached a, a point where we felt that we would be very confident to put our first baby inside the scanner. Uh, Pip Bridgen, who's pictured on the left here, is uh, the senior radiographer who is the superintendent downstairs. So Pip was also, of course, incredibly involved all the way through this and is in attendance at every single scan. So that's why I've, I've put a picture here. So this is our very first baby going in. Um, and for each neonatal scan, ooh, whoops, sorry. For each neonatal scan, then we have a radiographer, which is Pip, that you can see just standing next to the magnet here. And then we also have at least two members of clinical staff. So Alessandro is a doctor that you can see here. Megan is a nurse. Um, that's me, of course, there. And then... Um, we always have a physicist who's present as well at the scan, but in reality, usually there's about 10 people standing outside. For the first scan, there was about 20. So this was just us inside the scan room. And then there was, of course, everyone standing outside, including the person taking the photographs that you can see here. But it was obviously a very exciting moment to put the first baby in. So every baby, just to show you what they look like. So we're using a, a standard Nova head coil, the adult head coil. So every baby is then positioned in there with... Um, cushions that we get from Pearl Tech, who developed these specifically for us. So we use the head cushions, which are then molded around the ears to uh, offer additional acoustic protection, uh, and then the vacuum bag around them so they feel nice and swaddled and secure. Um, at the moment, obviously, because we're using this coil, it does mean that the baby is then positioned down towards the back. And then we found that that does increase our SNR. It does increase, it does obviously introduce some inhomogeneity, but it does mean that we've got much higher SNR because if we lift them right to the center of the coil, then we found that just it just impacts all on our SNR. So we'd rather have very good SNR at the posterior of the head and it's slightly decreasing as you get further forward rather than the whole thing not being as great. But um, in our RF lab, we we have now made a, a neonatal coil that's sized specifically for babies, and, and uh, we're just going through the institutional process now, and, and we're hoping that will obviously make a, a big dramatic difference for our SNR as well. 
Right, so we've now scanned a total of 52 neonates since that first one in May 2022 on, <laughs> on our Siemens system. Um, the median age of those children is, is 40 weeks postmenstrual age. This is just a distribution um, uh, that you can see here just to show. So the youngest of the babies that we scanned actually is a 33 plus four weeks preterm infant, and their weight was uh, one and a half kilograms. Um, and I'm pleased to say, basically, that we've had no adverse instance. Well, I wouldn't be standing here if we had. Uh, we've had no adverse incidents from, from scanning our babies on, on the seven Tesla system. So most of the babies are in there for about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, this, I have to say, this is a little bit misleading, this plot down here. This is how long they were inside the scanner as opposed to active scanning. Um, I, I would say active scanning probably is about 45 minutes in most cases. It's not largely, it's it's not because we have any problems or anything like that. We've kind of set this kind of idea in our head that we don't have the babies in there for too long. So we generally keep them in the scanner, regardless of whether or not we're doing active scanning for about an hour or so. But you can see some of them are a little bit longer and that's occasionally, I think all of us who work with babies know that you can't control whether or not they wake up for a second in the middle and then you might spend 10 minutes patting them on the chest to try and get them to settle again and so on. So that's why sometimes it can be a bit longer. Um, the, the key plot I think is this one down on the bottom right, just to show that, um, so our, our delta T, so our change in temperature, oh, it's come out very strangely, is not it? But basically the temperature was, um, was very stable. So there was no difference between the start and the end. I mean, you can see the blue there anyway, can't you? So you can see the, the blue, which is the, the median. Um, so there was no difference between the start and the end of the scan and the temperature. And there were no differences in temperature change across the entire scanning session in our babies. If anything, we've had a few babies who have got a little bit cold rather than, than, uh, than hot. So um, just to now finally show you some images. Um, so these are some of our um, first images from uh, T2 weighted images. And so actually on the top left, the very, very first baby that we scanned, unfortunately, was this baby with um, cystic peri periventricular leukemia. Um, the mother was an amazing lady, wonderful lady, and she was um, extremely excited and, and proud for her child to have a seven Tesla scan and to be the first one scanned. Um, and um, unfortunately, her baby's got really devastating um, cystic PVL, but she's uh, extremely committed and, and really wants the best for her child. And she, she really wants to, she said that, you know, she wants her baby to make a difference to, to all the other babies in the world who may have got similar difficulties. And so it's, it's a really, uh, um, for me, it was very moving that she was very uh, happy to be involved as our first scan. So you can see uh, the first scan on the top left there. Um, on the right is, so our very first babies, about the first 15 babies, all of them we scanned on the 3T system immediately before the 7T system on the same day, actually. Um, and just to give you an idea about the kind of uh, comparison, I've put these images up on, on the right here. Um, the resolution we, we increased, um, obviously, when we went to 7T. So our 3T acquisitions are 0 0.8, 0 0.8, with overlapping uh, slices of 1.6. And on 70, we're at 0 0.6, 0 0.6, with overlapping slices of 1.2. I have to confess, we haven't really pushed it further. We probably could push it further, but we actually feel pretty good about how they look. And, and uh, I'll, I'll explain more about why we haven't pushed it further than that. But um, I think even, even at this slight increase in resolution, you can probably immediately see some of the benefits from scanning at 70 compared to 3T. So 3T is across the bottom here. Um, in the first column here, this is the hippocampus at 3T and this is the hippocampus at 7T. So you can immediately see the difference in terms of the kind of detail that you can get across the hippocampus. You can see really nice, that, that kind of double ribbon effect across this beautiful. In the center here, this is the cerebellar thermis. So obviously you can see here much, much greater detail in terms of the um, Francis Cowan, who is one of my mentors when I was young, always used to call them the fronds of the cerebellum. You can see the fronds of the cerebellum much clearer uh in the in the upper one compared to the lower 3t scan and on the bottom here this is just the cortical folding in the occipital lobe and again you can see the cortical folding just uh, much much more crisper and cleaner on the um on the 7t images compared to the 3t images um so all of our images are required at that that resolution as i mentioned of 0 0.6 0 0.6 in plane and, and 1.2 millimeter overlapping slices what you can see here is is what we do with the images afterwards so we acquire at least two um orthogonal planes so at the top here is the axial acquisition from this child who's got some uh, actually some ventricular megaly um uh in the center is the sagittal acquisition so you can see um on the axial acquisition apart from the fact that there's obviously some, some inter-slice artifact that you can see here. There's also a little bit of motion artifact. It's not so clear actually on the screen up here, but 
Um, there's a little bit of motion artifact on there as well. The satchel acquisition, you can see the paper is relatively still, but still you can see a little bit of step artifact. You can see it's very nice in plain. But we then um, do slice to volume reconstruction and then super resolution. So we get down to 0.45 millimeter isotropic after uh, putting things together. And so you can see just an example of the, the uh, slice to volume reconstructed images across the bottom here. Um, so that's where we are now with the T2 acquisitions. This is an example from a preterm infant, 35 plus six weeks. Um, and hopefully you can start to appreciate some of the real sort of gains and some of the things that we can get when we move to seven Tesla. So it's not, I probably should have blown this up a little bit, but you can actually see, for example, the vessels coming through the white matter really nicely here. You can get some really nice contrast inside the white matter, of course, as well. The cortical folding is, is really beautiful, especially around the occipital area and over to the, the cingulate. Um, and also you can see ooh, the individual nuclei within the thalamide, the basal ganglia and things come out really beautifully as well at some Tesla. And of course, what that means is that with this kind of contrast and resolution, then the data is, is suitable then for further processing. And so this is just putting the data through the, the developing human connectome um, uh, project pipeline that you can see here to give us different kinds of cortical measures and to give us cortical surfaces and white matter surfaces across the bottom. Um, so the, the data itself is, is, of course, of extremely high quality, but it's also amenable to, to processing with um, different kinds of tools that are already developed and available through the, the imaging community. Um, so moving on to then other kinds of contrast, which I think is where, I mean, for us, T2 was, was nice. It was exciting. It showed us this extra detail. But for, for me, the really exciting thing is to think about what are the extra opportunities for imaging at ultra high field. Um, I think as a, as a really safe starting point, one of the first things we did was just look at susceptibility waste imaging, because obviously that's going to be massively enhanced when you move to ultra high field. And these are just some of our, our SWE images from some of the neonates, which I think are, are really you know very powerful images to look at. One of the things that was striking, actually, was that you can see on the top row, which is just a normal control infant, uh, and this is their, their MIP from their... Um, from their SWE, you can see that we can actually see both arteries and uh, veins, as well as the, the smaller vessels. So you can see the circle of Willis here, and you can see some of the uh, medial cerebral arteries coming out and the posterior cerebral arteries there, as well as um, some of the draining veins like the, the superior sagittal sinus that you can see here. So actually you get a very comprehensive picture of all the vessels in the brain, uh, just doing a SWE, um, doing a four minute SWE acquisition in, in babies. And also looking at pathology, you can get some really nice additional detail. So just on the bottom row, we've got this tiny cyst in the next preterm infant. And when we did the uh, SWE, we could see actually that clearly there was a hemorrhagic component to the origin of that cystic lesion. So you can see some, some uh, uh, small deposits around there and, and the adjacency next to those um, next to those draining veins here. Uh, and then over here, this was a, a sad baby that unfortunately has got quite, you can see there's quite abnormal signal in the white matter. So this was a baby who there was a um, maternal uh, hemorrhage uh, at the time of delivery. And so the baby suffered a very uh, a large hypoxic injury. But you can also see that there's on here, you can see on the T2, some small areas of hemorrhage. But when you look on the SWE, you can see how extensive that hemorrhage is uh, and how severe it is across the white matter. Um, so the other thing that we really wanted to do some work on was to understand about T1 values and, and T2 values in, in um, babies. And of course, we do see age trends, which is what you see at lower field as well. But of course, we see that T1 values are very, very different um, compared to what they might be at T2 or, of course, even at low, uh, sorry, at 3T or, or either at lower fields. And so what we wanted to do is really understand what those T1 values were so that we could optimize our T1 imaging, given what I showed you before from, from the initial experience in Utrecht and from talking with them in Utrecht, they really struggled to get good T1 contrast um, on their first images. So that was one of our first things that we really wanted to do was to try and get some T1 and, and T2 values. Um, and so this is where we are now with our MP2 ranges. Um, you can see they're a little bit noisy just from when the babies move from time to time, but I think we've got... Hopefully I can convince you that we're getting some really nice contrast now on our, on our T1 weighted images. So these are our 0.65 um, isotropic acquisitions. And you can see that we've got some really nice contrast, particularly for myelin, which you can see here and here and here. So in the posterior limb of the internal capsule, we can, we've started to get very nice um, contrast for myelin. And obviously the cortex is, is beautiful. Um, and you can see that effect that I was mentioning before that you can see it's a bit crisper around the back of the brain here around the occipital areas than it is for the, 
for the frontal area. So that's something I hope we can help with with trying to level out once we start to use a, a dedicated neonatal coil. Um, but these images, Professor Rutherford, who's the, the radiologist who reports on our images here, um, feels very good about these images and said that she would be very happy to, to clinically report these, which I think was uh, the first challenge that we really wanted to get, get to with, with RT1 weighted imaging. Um, Chiara Casella, who's pictured here, um, has also done some really nice work trying to develop QSM as well for, for neonates. Um, and what's nice, because she's been working previously on a, a project with children, for epilepsy is that and then she's collected some neonatal data and then she's got some child data and you can see that there very clearly is a contrast between child uh, and uh, neonates in terms of what's happening with with uh, um, QSM and R2 star values in uh, uh, different regions of the brain which is it was nice to see this kind of contrast is so obvious when, when we're just um, looking at the, the comparison between two relatively small groups of, of um, babies and uh, <laughs> Uh, the other clear area of gain is, is magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, so this is just a steam acquisition. We initially went into it hoping that we could do semi-laser. So this is an example where our conservative limits on the scanner prevented us from being able to do what we initially thought we wanted to do. So we were thinking about doing semi-laser. We found that would violate our, our, um, our uh, SAR model. And so we ended up doing the steam acquisition, which gives us reduced SAR. But actually... Um, despite that, we get very, very, I think, beautiful spectroscopy data. This is from four babies, and you can see how consistent the kind of spectra we get are. And you can see they're fitted with LC model, and you can see how small the residuals are in the fit. And I think really the most exciting one is baby four that you can see here, because this was just with 48 averages, so a spectra that was acquired just under three minutes. The voxel size is uh, it's a 16 by 16 by 16 voxel placed in the thalamus. And so we've got really uh, greatly improved frequency peak separation. We've got reduced noise, which is 48 averages in under three minutes. And so compared to on the 3T, we spent a long trying trying to optimize Megapress on, on our 3T scanner. And we were acquiring data for over 10 minutes um, to acquire data that it was, you know, obviously needed a lot of processing and it was an edited acquisition. So this is without editing. And still, you can clearly see GABA, for example, on here, which is just this little, little, uh, little hump around here. Um, and so what it means is that the, the ability to be able to do spectroscopy is just greatly enhanced when, when you move to 70. So lastly, I'm going to talk about my own passion, which Jessica mentioned before, and obviously is, is why I'm so excited to be doing the, the 70 scanning, which is to think about functional MRI. Um, and so functional MRI, ultra high field, obviously is one of the big gain areas. And so we know that spatial sensitivity, we know that specificity are, are going to be particularly improved with contrast depending on magnetic susceptibility. And so obviously that includes bold um, fMRI. Um, and uh, pioneers like John Paul and many were obviously doing this in adults many, many years ago now. So John's work here is 13 years ago, but just showing that the specificity is, is so precise that you can see differences across different cortical depths, across different cortical layers with fMRI. And when you're comparing, for example, 3T and 7T in the top left here, then you can really start to push the spatial resolution because the SNR is so much increased. So if a standard acquisition, uh, which you can see in the bottom left here is a kind of two millimeter voxel size, then you can see when you move to, to 70, then we can really push the acquisition voxel size to something like um, 0.7 millimeters or, or less. And what that means is that you can do really fine scale studies in the brain's functional architecture and you can get really, really nice exciting new insights oh sorry into the neural activity so even across these different cortical depths and regions and that means you can start to probe these kind of canonical circuit models of course we know from animal studies thinking about for example the feed forward uh, connections coming into layer four in the cortex and the feedback inputs then going into layers uh, one to three and then also uh, apart from the superficial the deeper layers as well so we can think about this kind of uh, granular and then super granular infra, infra granular layer type structure and then we can also think about how that's different across different regions of the cortex so you can explore things like association cortex you can explore the, the primary visual areas and how it connects to these kind of secondary visual processing areas and so this is just a, a really nice um uh, uh review which I'd, I'd highlight to anyone who's interested in looking into that area um so a neonatal MRI at 7T was something that we really wanted to try and get um, involved and, and optimize early. 
Um, I We couldn't have done any of this without John Paul Emeni, who is very excited to be working with us. So John's been really um, fantastic at, at helping us um, with our 70 fMRI acquisitions for neonates. And my PhD student, Yucha, who's just in the bottom here, who's actually with John at the moment. So she's, she's over there for three months uh, at MGH Harvard, um, learning from, from their team. So just to show you about what we can, or what we've started to be able to do with functional MRI at 70 on the uh, left here, this is the DHCP acquisition. So this is kind of, you know, the, the state of the art in terms of what we can do with 3T for resting state fMRI. On the top left is the acquired bold fMRI data itself. And uh, on the bottom there is, is the kind of sensory motor resting state networks that you might be able to get from, uh, from 3T fMRI data. So our initial resting state data, we just wanted to go, we want to push the, the resolution, but not push it too hard. So we went to a resolution of one millimeter isotropic, um, which is what you can see here. And immediately you can see that the um, just the, the raw bold images themselves look like a T2, basically. So you can see how much contrast you've got on, on uh, a standard scan. I, I mean, I, we were just amazed just to see just these images alone. And then just putting it through an ICA, this is even without any denoising and without much processing, just a, a standard ICA analysis. This is the kind of sensory motor resting state network that we got from our first data um, scanning neonates at 7T, just showing how beautifully it hugs along the, um, along the core tipple ribbon. So this was, for us, it was really nice validation. It was really exciting to see it. And it really showed how much more sensitivity, um, how much more we can achieve with the resolution. And of course, it means that also how much more we can really dramatically improve our spatial specificity as well. Um, so just to give you an idea then of the kind of resting state networks then what we get now in, in uh, neonates. So this is just, um, in fact, it's the same baby I showed you before. This is a preterm baby who I showed you uh, after the SVR reconstruction. And this was their resting state network. So you can see the sensory motor network. You can see down on the bottom left here. I've just put some of the key examples in, um, which is uh, a bit of a registration problem there. But you can see it following along the cortex really beautifully. Um, you can see this uh, around the posterior cingulate. And you can see some activation within the insula. This prefrontal one you can see again, which is hugging around the, the cortex in the, in the uh, interhemispheric fissure. And then the visual one, I think it's, it's particularly beautiful when you see it in this coronal slice here, which doesn't look like much of a brain, but you can see how it's really going along the cortex there, how it's all along the cortical margin. Um, and so this shows us that resting state, um, probing resting state activity is really very achievable and very exciting and much more uh, uh, um, not sure meaningful is the right word, but much more uh, biologically, I suppose, it can give us much more information than, than if we were to try and to just look at 3T data. But then thinking about that further, and one of the things, one of the reasons that we got in contact with, with John and what we really wanted to push forwards with was trying to think about functional activity across cortical depths. So this is the work that I did many years ago in 3T, looking at fMRI activation following passive movement of the right hand in a term equivalent neonate. And you can see, um, sorry, I was a bit lazy. I took this from a previous presentation, but that's the that's a, uh, diffusion tract, obviously. That's the uh, um, uh, the thalamocortical tract, but this is the area of activity that you can see here from when they're moving their right hand. So you can see that there's a well-localized uh, cluster of activity that's located just posterior to the central sulcus. It's in the uh, contralateral side to the side that was moving, so in the left hemisphere. Um, so then we did the same thing then, or we started doing the same thing in our seven Tesla babies. Uh, and so we basically have now moved to doing a um, EPI acquisition over about seven minutes or so. Our resolution is 0.8 millimeters isotropic. Um, our TE is 48 milliseconds, which is longer than you might do in an adult, but because of the longer T2 star times in babies, we've slightly pushed it out. And um, to try and maintain some kind of sensible TR, what we're doing is basically doing a slab rather than the whole brain. And we're, we're not using any simultaneous multi-slice because we thought what we want to do is just really focus on we're interested in what's happening and answering specific questions about what's happening in the cortex at the top. Uh, and one of the things that we found immensely useful was using um, DPG. So uh, dual, dual polarity grapper made a massive difference for us in terms of reducing the kind of ghosting artifacts that we were getting without it. Um, we use a, a MRC for robotic device that you can see on the top right here. So it's just a little pneumatic device. It's 3D printed. A uh, little frame, the baby's hand goes and, and holds onto a little par, bar, and you can see there's a little yellow Lego piston across the bottom here. 
So I strongly advise if anyone wants to work with pneumatics to make a uh, stimulation device inside the scanner, Lego is fantastic mm -hmm. because they produce Lego to a very high standard. It's always the same. It is always where, uh, you know, works incredibly well and it's very cheap. So we bought like a hundred of these tiny little pistons for, I can't remember, we bought them off eBay for like 20 pounds or something like that. And then we've just used them through the years and, and they always do the job. So there's a little Lego piston on the bottom here. And then basically then um, it's connected to the medical uh, air via a control unit that contains valves. So we just specify when we want the valves to open then it pushes air into the piston and then basically helps to, to move the baby's hand. <laughs> And so we, we started to do that. This is the kind of activity that we see in the baby. So you can see it's it's really nice. Again, well localized activity. I'm sorry, it's a bit small, but you can see it's very clearly localized to the cortex, just posterior to the cervical sulcus. And then we can start to then explore these kind of depth profiles that we've been talking about. So we can look at what's happening across the different layers. We know that the neonatal cortex is about one and a half millimeters thick, something like that, as thickest, it's around two millimeters. Um, so we can look at the peel surface, the mid cortex and the white matter boundary are the three layers that we started off looking at. And we can explore the differences in statistics and the cluster size. And then we can also start to use some of the resources that exist in the um, amazing laminar fMRI community. So they've been also incredibly, incredibly um, um, enthusiastic about the work, incredibly, incredibly helpful. They're talking to people like um, Renzo Huber, as well as John and uh, different people across that community. Then they've really helped us as well with different ideas and, and with the analysis and things. And so just to, to kind of say, well, what can we do with this? So on the top right is the kind of double hump kind of response that people typically expect to see within the motor cortex. Uh, at seven Tesla when they're looking at lambda specific responses, which um, is presumed then to relate to the kind of input and output layers uh, within the cortex. And actually, when we look at our neonatal data, we indeed can see if we look at percent signal change, we can indeed see that we get some, uh, we get a double hump, uh, which is very exciting to see when we are exploring our data. So that's once you detrend the kind of Venus, um, uh, the big uh, difference on the, across the Venus compartment. My other passion, which is really relates all the way back to my PhD. So this was very exciting for me because then this went back all the way to my PhD when there were things that I just wish I could have answered in my PhD, which I couldn't at the time, just because we didn't have that kind of sensitivity, is to look at the actual hemodynamics and to understand the depth dependent hemodynamics. And so here you can see um, what happens. I seem to have lost my cursor. Oh, there we go. So here we can see what happens then um, looking at the actual time course of the, the activation itself. And so the blue trace here is the superficial layers, uh, the gray, green is the middle and the, the red is the deepest layers. And so what we can see is that we get the biggest bulk yeah. responses um, on the most superficial layers, which of course is where you probably would expect to see it. Because if we think about the, the vascular architecture, you have the arteries running across the surface, the peel arteries, and then they dive in uh, penetrate perforating down into the cortex and then they drain back up through the veins and the veins actually drain across the surface as well and so I think you know and this is what people will see in adults as well that you see the largest amount of change within the venous compartment because that's where there'll be the biggest swing in bold signal because of the deoxygenated hemoglobin and similarly we see that the largest amount of signal change is always on the surface on, on the superficial uh, part but what's interesting is that when you look at single subjects what we also see is something that's a bit more specific in some of them where we might see, for example, we get a nice initial dip in the superficial layer. So you can see that there's a, a decrease in the signal here. And actually what's interesting is that we also saw that there seems to be quite a long um, prolonged, and you can even actually see it on the on the top one here, that there is actually quite a prolonged response inside the deep and, and uh, middle layers as well, which kind of suggests that probably what's happening is that there's a lot of passive dilation inside the, the vascular system. There isn't so much elasticity and the actual way that the system is dilating and responding to activation is different to what we see in adults, where everything is much more active with active back propagation of, of dilation. And so what we get is a very different kind of time course to what you might see in adults or characteristically as seen in adults. And so on here is just to show basically we see the largest percent signal change on the um on the surface. Um, and then we can also see that here we get the, the maximum signal change on the surface. But what we don't see is big changes in the time to peak, for example, whereas in adults, what you see is that the time to peak in the superficial layers is, is definitely pushed back. And that's because of the predominantly coming from the venous compartment. So I, this is something that we're really trying to understand. It may be that perhaps there are different kinds of shunt systems within there. So perhaps that to, 
it's just just completely a hypothesis and one which I'd love to discuss with someone if they've got any ideas that perhaps because of the differences in compliance, then what happens is to to kind of protect the developing cortex, that there are actually additional shunts. And there there is some animal work that suggests this, that this might be the case, that shunts arterial blood directly into the venous system to try and prevent too much blood going into the the cortex uh, in the capillary bed and and causing any damage. So I think this is is a really exciting kind of active area of research that we we really wanted to do more work on. Um, I don't know how much time I've talked there, but... uh, Hopefully we can we can have some really lively discussion. So really, that, that's that's just all I was going to say, which is our first studies. Uh, hopefully I've convinced you that it's safe and feasible to perform detailed studies of brain activity and also the brain, of course, itself in neonates at ultra high field. Um, and hopefully I've convinced you that our first studies um, demonstrate the kind of marked gains and achievable resolution in contrast for anatomical imaging, but also the kind of increased sensitivity that we get across other multiple contrasts. And it can provide a really a new window into the brain development at its crucial stage of life. And high resolution fMRI studies um, really show already promise to study depth specific patterns of activation and to really unpick the relationships between bulb responses and Oh gosh, and vasculature and uh, understanding microcircuitry. And I'll just finish by really thanking um, oh, everyone who's been involved in this work, um, particularly um, Bamana, who's here today, um, Yucha, who's been really leading the way on, on as for her PhD with the fMRI work, uh, but the rest of the group who I'm very uh, proud and excited to work with. And then uh, Shahan and Pip, who I mentioned, who are the key players in, in get, moving forwards. And then also um, John at MGH Harvard and Raphael from Siemens. Um, we do have a preprint that you can see in the bottom there if you uh, want to check it out to, to have a look. It's just really a summary of the kind of work I've talked about today. Thank you very much.